we are officially halfway through the Into the Inklands metagame, which is really crazy to say because that means we're only six weeks from Ursula's return. It is kind of crazy to think of how quickly these metagames really do develop and pass by as one set to the next. Now, we do kind of get a one-week uh, addition to this because the Lorcana Challenge in Atlanta is going to be an Into the Inklands metagame with Ursula's Return not being legal for the tournament. So we will get a little bit of a bonus week to kind of really decide what was the best deck within the metagame. Uh, utilizing all of the three-month kind of information to get to that one sum total of winner. So while we're here, I think it's a great time to take a look at this past weekend's event, which was a really good simulation of what the Lurkana challenges may look like because of the two-game system, along with we actually have a full meta breakdown of all decks registered for that tournament, which is really sweet. And then we also have the broad scope look of the first six weeks of Into the Inklands total meta report and all of the top cut breakdowns as we go through and look at the most recent successful decks in Disney Lurkana. So let's get into it because it's a lot of data today. So these are the registered decks from the pack challenge this weekend. You can see here with the graph showcasing that of these in combinations, these were the ones that were most successful. There were uh, a couple other stragglers like Ruby, Emerald, uh, that were registered, but they were not successful in any manner, so we didn't really count them, plus we didn't want this graph to get too, too crazy. But the interesting thing here to note is that in the order that you see it here, Ruby Sapphire, Ruby Amethyst, Amber Steel, all coming in with 50, 49, and 49 registered decks. Sapphire Steel came in with 44, Ruby Amber and Emerald Steel at 23 each, Emerald Amethyst at 18, Amethyst Steel at 16, Amethyst Amber at 7, and Amethyst Sapphire at 5. A lot of times we talk about uh, Ruby Amethyst as this like almighty, ridiculous thing that always finds its way into multiple top 8s and multiple top 16s in bigger events because it's the most played deck in the room. That is simply not true in this case. Ruby Sapphire was the most played deck in this room, and Amber Steel was right behind it along with Sapphire Steel. The interesting here to note is the ratios in which these decks converted into a top cut finish. So let's take a look at those. So as you can see here, there were six Ruby Amethyst, three Emerald Steel, two Emerald Amethyst, and then one of each of the following. One Amber Steel, one Ruby Sapphire, one Amethyst Sapphire, one Amethyst Steel, and one Sapphire Steel. So for the conversion rates, for anyone that are wondering, Ruby Amethyst had a 12.24% conversion rate, Emerald Steel had a 13%, Emerald Amethyst had 11%, and crazy enough, the biggest turn ratio was actually the Amethyst Sapphire with a 20% conversion rate because there was only five registered decks in the field. But the rest of the numbers are the shocking ones. Although Sapphire Steel, Amber Steel, and Ruby Sapphire were three of the four most played decks in the room, they ended up having a less than 0.02% ratio uh, in terms of tournament participant to top cut participant. Now, the crazy thing here is obviously Sapphire Steel was the number one deck going into the top 16. It did end up losing in top 16 to the inevitable winner of the tournament, which was Amber Steel. But it's kind of crazy to say that in the top 16, that there was only one and one for Amber Steel and Sapphire Steel. And they had to play each other in the top 16. Amber Steel, one of 49 participants in the entire event, gets the win, which is a crazy ratio. But all in all, you can see that the stats from, you know, participant to top contender, it really is an interesting stat line to say that, yeah, Ruby Amethyst was tied for second most, but it still had six conversion rates where the other three decks had only one. So it's really a difficult situation. And, you know, this kind of looping question of 
why Ruby Amethyst remains to be more successful than these other decks. And at the end of the day, I, I think it really does come into consistency and play skill. You know, I think Sapphire Steel, Amber Steel, and in some cases, Ruby Sapphire are much more difficult decks to pilot. There's many more decisions that have to be made in order to be accurate and get the most out of your deck. And Ruby Amethyst just offers so much drawing potential and so much consistency that, to me, that's the core reason that we are continuously seeing it be successful within the Lorcana metagame. But enough about this type of data, let's start looking at some deck lists. This past weekend, we threw together 66 cards and didn't give a crap about anything. Instead of banishing all of the Jedi, we simply decided to banish all 296 participants in the pack challenge this weekend, as DeCandio picked up his second victory within the tournament circuit. I think the craziest thing to say about this deck is, yes, it is 66 cards. And the crazier thing is, it's 66 cards because, and I quote, I didn't know what to cut. We didn't even care. We didn't, we, it didn't matter. We really just strictly said, hey, we're going to play 66 good cards. I mean, if you really look at this list, it is a compilation of good cards. You know, we're not playing Flutes. We're not playing Pride Lands. We're not playing Bayou. We're not playing... Uh, you know, Heart of Atlantis, you're, are all of these, like, randomly okay, situationally good cards in certain matchups. Like, no, we, we're we not even doing that. We're just like, hey, here's every good song in the combination that's playable. Maybe we can argue that this could have had some level of Greatest Criminal Minds if you wanted to. But realistically, it's just a compilation of 66 really, really good cards in Disney Lorcana. And you take that mixture of good cards and you take a good player like Decandio and you banish every single other participant, just like Order 66, which is the deck that is called. Congratulations, Decandio. Very well played. And um, yeah, sometimes it just proves that good players are good and good cards are good. And every now and then it is a little bit nice to be better lucky than good. Congratulations. Let's check on the next one. Green Bounce Emerald Amethyst once again showcasing its strength within the Disney Lorcana metagame. This deck has really continuously evolved a bunch over the last several weeks, at this point nearly two months. But at its core, this deck really is the same. Uh, it is a very, very typical amethyst core you know if you really look at the version of this deck you could see this exact same amethyst core in a ruby deck or in a sapphire deck or in a steel deck so all of these cards that you're seeing here are just being proven that hey amethyst core is really really powerful it's really really consistent and you can really take that core and add it with any other ink combination and see success as we're going to see throughout this, uh, you know, meta report in all honesty. But the Emerald cards here are here to shine. Curse Merfolk and Flynn Rider really are pressuring opponents early. Ursula removing the core songs that really disrupt your particular strategy. Kit Cloud Kicker being the ultimate on the draw card to kind of swing back momentum to your favor. And then, of course, the song package of Just Friends on the Other Side and Mother's Knows Best is the wonderful addition with Ursula Deceiver of All. This deck truly does pack a punch, and it really has a lot of situations where it kind of just says, hey, I'm going to do my thing, and if you cannot stop me or you cannot slow me down or you can't figure out the best way to answer what I'm doing, then I'm just going to beat you to a pulp. And my favorite part about this is that it has kind of developed other ways to now pressure the game late, more consistent draw, uh, utilizing the Queen's Castle, utilizing Yzma. If you can ever get off a double friends on the other side with Ursula Deceiver of All, uh, in most cases, it's really, really bad news bears for your opponent. A huge shout out again to Julian here. I believe this is not the first time we have seen this name. This player has been super successful into the Inklands metagame. And another great 
finish in the largest Pixelborn tournament to date. Ruby Sapphire had 50 registered decks this past weekend, but only one of them found a way into the top eight finish. This is another deck that over the course of the last few weeks, we've seen develop more and more and more. Now making the decision, like most Ruby decks, having a split between Lady Trimming and Medusa, having the four Maleficens, the four Be Prepared, sticking with the Maui's hook, of course, the four Maui's. You know, you really look at this list and you go, hey, it's actually only 21 Ruby cards. Uh, four Queen, four Maui, four Maleficent, four Be Prepared, the 2-2 two -two split for Lady Tremaine and Mana Medusa, and the one Maui's Hook. The rest of this deck, to its core, is a Sapphire deck. It's a Sapphire ramp deck utilizing the wonderful one jump ahead to kind of accelerate itself into some really crucial moments early on in the game, even if... Even a play such as a turn three McDuck's Manor can turn into a sufficient amount of lore to make Lucky Dime all the more brutal. Uh, this deck is really, really good at accelerating quickly into Dime, which it's completely able to just take a turn off to play Dime, let its opponent extend more into the board, and then be prepared away. And then from that point forward, kind of continuously chain cards like Gaston, Cards like Lady Tremaine, cards like Tomateo and Maleficent that are all two or three lore characters that are consistently removing things from the board or adding more threats to the board or even replacing themselves and really just forcing your opponent the entire game to, to answer every single card that you put into play or Lucky Dime just simply says, I'm going to, you know, in three or four turns, gain enough lore with my characters and gain enough lore with Dime, and then, of course, the McDuck's Manor as an additional threat. All sorts of ways to really pressure opponents into really, really poor decisions. This deck's biggest fault is just missing its early game curve. Any of the games in which you mulligan into really slow starting hands, it's really, really difficult to come back from. But it is one of those things at the end of the day of, is this deck showing its true colors of being a little more difficult for most players to be successful with, with only one of 50 decks registered finding a way into a top 16. Shout out to Banana Ball. I'm sure he will also be covering this deck on his YouTube channel. So if you haven't checked him out yet, be sure to check him out. Congrats on the top eight serve. Last weekend, and honestly the last few weekends, Emerald Steel has been on the bottom of the meta reports. There has not been that much success for this deck. It's really fallen off. And I really, you know, was starting to question what does this deck need to do to modify itself to come back as a threat in the metagame? Well, this weekend was a great time to do it. Uh, three of the 23 decks registered were able to convert into a top eight finish, not even top 16. Three of these decks ended up winning their top 16 matchup to finish in top eight. And inevitably, one of them were in the top four. This deck had a ton of success this weekend. And really what it's looking at is now we've gone back to Prince John. Uh, adding that dual layer threat of really forcing your opponent and kind of using the information in some cases of Ursula. You know, when you play your Ursula Deceiver, you see what your opponent's doing. You see if they have an answer to your Ursula Deceiver of all. If they don't, you can kind of slam Ursula down. And if they do... You can actually slam Prince John down and then start utilizing some of your other discard potential uh, to really kind of just extend games in a very positive manner for yourself. The biggest problem with this list is that it was over, kind of like over committing to Ursula. So when you would play Ursula Deceiver All, you'd be like, okay, if you can answer it, I'm kind of screwed. But if you can't answer it, then I can punish you. Now you've kind of changed the game where you're like, okay, I can see they have an answer to this Ursula right now. So can I extend the length of time until I have to play it and then add a threat like Prince John that's going to consistently now get you a buyback on all your discard cards? Uh, I think that's a great transition. It was a great pickup. Really, really excited to see if this deck can continue to evolve. I do not think that this version of this deck or the honestly any of the versions of this deck that we had seen in Top Cup this weekend is the best version of this list. But what it really does is it shakes the whole meta game again, and it says, hey, this deck is still here, it is still contending, and it really is starting to showcase that this meta game is consistently evolving. We are consistently seeing 
you know, altercations and evolutions of every single deck within the metagame. And I think that is really spectacular. It's really showcasing that this meta might be way more wide open than the two previous metas uh, that we've played in for First Chapter and Rise of the Floodworm. All in all, huge shout out to the player here. Top four finish. There was two other these decks in top eight. Uh, you know, gigantic shout out to Emerald Steel coming back this weekend and showcasing that it has the power and the potential to really just kind of ruin the metagame all over again. Let's get into the next thing. So as I said at the top, we are six weeks through the Into the Inklands metagame. Guys, it is so tough to continuously say Into the Inklands. I mean, seriously, it's a tongue twister. Just say it like five times fast and see how it goes. It's getting difficult. I keep messing up. I'm being honest. But if we take a full scope look at this, yep, um, that's 103 Ruby Amethyst decks, which is kind of crazy, but... Again, I, I think that it's this, oh, it's this tough thing to let go. And I I don't want to blame budget. I really don't. Um, but, you know, it, it could be that. There is a level of Ruby Amethyst decks are sub $200 decks. Uh, you know, in most cases, the deck that we registered for SCG Philly was a $150 deck at the time. You know, now the deck might be like $160, $170, but it's still below $200 in most cases. Some of these lists are playing zero Queen's Castle and zero Maleficence, which are ironically like the most expensive cards in the deck. So if you're not even playing those cards, this deck gets even cheaper. Um, it might be playing a really large factor. But the cool thing to note here is that it is only 35% of the metagame. And I know that that sounds like this crazy, ridiculously high number, but if we go back, you know, six weeks, six weeks ago, this deck was 51% of the metagame. So dropping 16% is a massive drop off in six weeks. A whole new set. Yes, it's still the king. Yes, it's still the most successful. It has multiple wins in very large events. You know, we're not taking that away from anything here. But it is nice to know that Into the Inklands really did push every other deck up in a very positive manner, which is very, very nice to say. Uh, and I think that's the biggest takeaway here is although we can see that it's still dominating the metagame, 35% is still a very large number. And you could probably expect to see that type of percentage in most of your high-level tournaments. As you saw at the top there, we did see a really nice, you know, Ruby Sapphire, Ruby Amethyst, Amber Steel, and Sapphire Steel mesh of most played decks in the room, and they were all very close in numbers. We are still seeing that the most successful are Ruby Amethyst, though. Um, you know, and, and it really hasn't slowed down ever. It's not like this was top heavy in the beginning and it slowed down. Every single week we've had Ruby Sapphire as king, including this week, it would have had the most top eights as well. So we're still not getting out of that world where Ruby Sa uh, Ruby Amethyst is going away. Uh, so let's just kind of have to roll. We're going to have to roll with those punches as we go. You can see the drop-off here. You know, it is a big drop-off. When we look at the list in total, uh, Ruby Amethyst is 35.5% of the metagame. Amber Steel is 12.4%. Ruby Sapphire is 12%. 12 Amethyst Steel is 8.2%. Emerald Steel is 82 Emerald Amethyst is 7.5, Sapphire Steel is 6.2, and Ruby Amber is 6%. Uh, you know, those are mostly positive numbers, I would say. Everything else is obviously sub 1% there, which is very, very mediocre. Ruby Steel had a couple top eights early on in the season, has gone away completely. Amber Amethyst has had a few here and there uh, throughout the weeks, but nothing too crazy. And Amber Sapphire, for whatever reason, has had, uh, you know, a very high amount of success for a very low amount of participation, I would say. I would definitely 100% guess that of all the decks in this list, that has probably the best conversion rate uh, for decks registered as Amethyst Sapphire being successful in the tournaments that they're being played in. It's definitely uh, in combination that's not talked about a whole bunch, but has really shown its worth in this particular metagame, especially in Rise of the Floodborne, there were zero amethyst sapphire decks in any top cut through all three months of the meta so you can see here they're already in six weeks in saying that you know we have this number of them i believe the number is five uh that's 
pretty good. You know, it's it's nothing to shy away about. All in all, I'd love to know your thoughts on this chart. You know, are you upset that Ruby Amethyst is still kind of towering over everything, being that skyscraper? Are you happy that all of these other decks are kind of up there being successful? Nearly 10% each on a couple of these, which is really nice. It is, I mean, light years better uh, than the last meta game, as far as I'm concerned. And I, I really, it's really hard to put, you know, the finger on the pulse of it. I do wonder how much of this is, hey, uh, you know, it's kind of what I had. It's it was easy for me to pick up the new cards I needed because they were cheap. You know, it turns out that I don't need Jim Hawkins. I don't need RLS Legacy. I don't even need all these other cards. I kind of might just need Queen's Castles. Um, and, and maybe that's it, in all honesty. You know, even Medusa now is kind of falling out of favor, going back to Lady Tremaine. So this deck really hasn't evolved too much in that sense of the world. But it definitely has the toolbox-ish effect of saying, maybe I want to play Prince Eric's this week. Maybe I want to play Medusa's this week. You know, maybe I want to be Queen's Castles and gyms and things like that. There was a deck in the top 16 this past weekend that had Agrabah's, RLS Legacies, gyms, Queen's Castle. So, like, there's clearly other ways to be successful with this list, which I think is the most interesting. But all in all, it's it's a really cheap, cheap deck. Um, so, I don't know. Let's take a look at the most recent Ruby Amethyst deck from Team TFM. So, this is the deck that Rob Serpe piloted to a top 16 finish this weekend. Uh, the TFM RA Control is a list that we are obviously always working on as a team. It's the list that so far within the metagame we've had the most success with. George having multiple top eights in large events, winning SCG Philly. Uh, Rob having three top eights, actually winning uh, 1K a few weekends ago, and then top 16-ing this event, all with Ruby Amethyst. So this is a list that we are consistently molding as a team really going through, having the discussions, what is good this week? And that is the real question here. And I think that's the one thing that gets lost in translation is that like, it's so easy to say, hey, uh, this is the best deck, you know, yesterday. Uh, in all honesty, yesterday is, is the answer. The This deck has probably already changed five cards, maybe six cards, maybe eight cards, maybe 10 cards. That's the cruelest you know, innovation of this particular list this year, uh, or I should say this season, where we are consistently saying, you know, today Chernobog was good. Maybe tomorrow it's not. Three weeks ago, Olaf was the best card ever. Maybe today it's not. A few weeks ago, we felt Teeth and Ambitions was a necessary evil at SCG Philly. Now we don't. Uh, the Queen's Castle wasn't even in our original winning list for the SCG 5K. Now it's back in. You know, I it's a really, really evolution of this list and understanding that with each week, if you can predict right, if you can guess your metagame correctly, your local metagame or the tournament that you're preparing for, you can really fill in those last 10, 12 cards to fit you know, the, the grand scope of mold that you really wanted to. And I think that's the really interesting thing about Ruby Amethyst. And I also think that's why you see it being so successful is because of the amount of flavor that it can bring and the amount of accessibility and transformability that, you know, this in combination really has shown. Shout out to Rob again for the top 16. Uh, kid's been on a fire ever since SCG Hartford. It's kind of insane. Talking about budget decks, uh, both of these decks come in at under $88. $87.60 and $82.33. Purple Steel, Amethyst Steel uh, being the budget aggro deck here. And then, of course, the Sapphire Amethyst. He called it Blurple, which I can respect. You know, once again, you just look at these decks and you can see the Amethyst core. Uh, aside from the Pua here hanging out in Blurple, uh, and of course, you know, there are some differences within these lists from the traditional, but, you know, Befuddle is a card that can definitely be found in Ruby Amethyst decks when necessary. Pua is absolutely the standout here, the cute little pig kind of playing its role. I think that's a very interesting call. I'm actually, I would love to know why that particular card over, um, you know, the Cusco, the, I would say the traditional Cusco, but nonetheless, I can respect it. I love the little pig. Uh, you know, everything else about the Amethyst core is there though. The Mims, the Merlins, you know, the Spellbook, the Yzma has been another recurring card. Uh, you know, instead of having Queen's Castle, we have Midduck's Manor in Sapphire, have the Tala, have the Hiram and the Popsicles with the Mickey Mouse. We end up 
Going back to an, an oldie but goodie in the form of Elsa, Spirit of Winter. That's a card that you don't see too often anymore, so it's nice to see that card getting some love in this particular list. Uh, all in all, $82 deck, top 16 of the biggest Pixelborn tournament to date. That's pretty awesome, considering that you could basically anybody could probably just play this list this weekend at their league if they wanted to because of how cheap it is and how likely that most of these cards are already just sitting in their binder just not being used. And then, of course, even from a couple weeks ago when Zach Bivens piloted this Amethyst Steel aggro deck to a top four finish at CCS, we've consistently seen this deck kind of growing and transforming and molding itself. Coming up to an $87 from a $60 deck is not much of a difference, so... This is another perfect deck that if you're just looking to kind of smash cards in and really be the aggressor in games, then this deck offers you all that and more. You know, solidifying two spell books is wild. Four Benjen is uh, also pretty insane. It's a card that we've you know definitely have respectfully seen more of recently, but to go all the way to the lens of four of them is pretty crazy. But hey, a three cost two three with two lore that has the ability to banish an item. Hard to say no to that one, so all in all, congrats to both of these players on their awesome finish this weekend. Sapphire Steel. So this list was the number one overall deck in the first day before the top cut uh, of the pack challenge this weekend. And yeah, this is another list that we've consistently seen molded and modified and evolve over the last couple of weeks, showcasing you know the power that this list really can offer. Bell is a card that I believe has sometimes fallen out of complete favor, but then out of nowhere brought itself right back into the metagame. The addition of Lucky Dime to this list uh, and the you know the concept of being a, a whole new world ramp deck, basically giving yourself as many potential options to get everything out of your hand as quickly as possible to get the most out of your whole new world and then also act as a pseudo win condition with the idea that later in the game, if you just drop a bell and instantly gain five lore because of Lucky Dime, I mean, that is just, that's a quarter of what you need to do in any given game. Uh, it, it's a really, really powerful play. You know, coming back in, understanding that we do need a little bit of removal from the Let It Goes, Grab Your Swords Haven't Gone Anywhere, Four Tinkerbells. You know, this deck is still doing everything it really wants to be doing uh, as often as possible. And it's just kind of quietly been molding itself into what we are seeing now. I still believe there are many versions of this deck that will be successful. This is probably, again, like a 52 or 53 card deck with a 7 card swing. I've seen lists without McDuck's Manor. These ones have it. I've seen lists with Hades. This one doesn't. You know, uh, I've seen the list with 4 Gaston's. I've seen versions of this deck with Tomateos. Like, you know, it's a consistently evolving deck again, very similar to Ruby Amethyst, and being able to weigh, being able to find a way to mold into the best version of itself on a given weekly basis, depending on what you're playing against or what your expected metagame is in your next tournament. Shout out to Dragon's Horde, uh, held a 2.5 case event or a 1.5k tournament. And this was the second place runner-up, Amber Ruby. But Amber Ruby was also uh, the only other deck above 5% of the metagame, so I really wanted to give a shout-out to it. Plus, this was the only 1K this weekend that was reported that had more than 30 players. So it was definitely a quiet weekend in the States because of Easter. Uh, but hey, you know, we got to give credit where credit is due. This is another deck that over the course of several weeks... Amber Ruby has definitely had numbers within the metagame. And this is just another evolution of that, another version of it. You know, we see in this version, Baloos and Chernabogs. Those are cards that I'm not crazy familiar with seeing in other versions of Ruby Amber, which is just showcasing, hey, at the end of the day, this is a Mufasa toolbox deck. And, you know, cards like Baloo, cards like Chernabog, and kind of recycling everything back into your deck to really give yourself the more and full effect of the Mufasa toolbox might go a long way. Three Lady Tremains, two Medusa, four Maleficents. And hey, if you ask me, every time you banish Mufasa, Maleficent flips over anyway. So that's just the perfect 100%. But all in all, this deck, again, showcasing its power uh, in the paper TCG world.
So there we have it, the most up-to-date list, uh, you know, through six weeks. I do this every single week. You can go back to week one, see some of the popular decks then, compare them to the list today. Basically, everything on here is kind of also on there. It's just been a circular and updated version of things as the metagame truly has evolved. I know that this list right here, it looks scary. It looks, you know, frustrating. I bet to many that it says, man, I really was hoping Ruby Amethyst got knocked down a peg. And, and it, it did, uh, crazy enough. It got knocked down from 51% to 35%. That's 16% difference in a six-week period of time, which is a massive, massive difference. And the cooler thing is the amount of decks that did go up by you know five six percent each which i think is the more important thing here to note so all in all i do believe that the inklands metagame is a pretty healthy one and i do believe that all of these decks and we can you know we've really seen it over and over again uh have the ability to just come out on top in a given weekend you know this weekend we had three emerald steel decks in the top eight and the weekend before we only had one of them in the entire weekend that had eight or nine tournaments all over the world. So you can see how quickly the metagame can flip from one side to the other just based on what opponents are preparing for. It really, it's not necessarily the rock, paper, scissors mentality. I might actually compare it to the rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock mentality for all my Big Bang Theory fans. Uh, it, it's just, I think it's in a really good place. I think it's a really difficult place. I think the most competitive tournament players really dislike these kinds of metagames because there's there's really not a perfect deck. I don't I don't believe so. I really do not feel that right now in the metagame that there is a perfect deck that says, hey, I am guaranteed to put myself in a position to win against everything. I think there are certain decks that, you know, can do it, but not in a crazy consistent manner. And then I think there's a deck like Ruby Amethyst that on average, you're going to get the same type of control game style and consistent game style. So therefore, you're always in every single match, which is what certain players really lean towards. And they try to leverage their play skill uh, over, you know, maybe randomness a little bit. But all in all, I am pretty content with this metagame. I would love to know in the comments how you feel about it. Uh, I'd love to know, like, hey, we are six weeks through. Where are we at? Set champs are coming up. You know, what are you trying to hone in now for the next few weeks as we prepare for set champs? And then, of course, a month after that, we're going to have uh, the Disney Lorcana Challenge. So there's a lot to be excited about in Disney Lorcana right now. Uh, obviously, a lot of this data, you know, was taken through the first six weeks. A lot of the decade, a lot of the deck lists showcased in this event were all from the Pixelborn tournament this weekend. But you know, if you really go back to that first week. And you compare it to this week, you can see that it, it's it's slow evolution uh, and changes and modifications to really go through this entire circle of life in a way. So shout out to everyone this weekend, you know, 297 player tournament, lots of success from a lot of really great players in Disney Lorcana. And hey, Order 66 was good enough for the taking out the Jedi and it was good enough for taking out 296 other players. Thank you guys so much for watching today, and we'll see you in the next one.